one and Kathy, Matthew, Kathy, and Kathy, and the other one, the other company, the other company, the body of the Singapore Drug Development Service capability. So in this webinar today, our catalog product manager, Dr. John Yu, is going to introduce the industry nine Western blocks of flow, incorporated with Genscript instruments, which includes eBlock, eSync, and eSquare, and the benefits that they will bring to your experiment. So this webinar will take around five minutes, and it will be a recorded session. You can type in your questions in the chat box, and we'll answer them after the presentation. If you didn't get to answer your question during the Q&A session, we'll be sure to take down and I will email back to you. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. John to start his presentation. Dr. John, over to you right now. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me clearly? You can start the presentation okay, right now. Okay, I can start the presentation. All right. Uh, okay, um, so today we'll talk about um, what we did for protein analysis as um, it's a very common technique we used in uh, laboratories to research, uh, you know, Hello. regulations Hello. of different processes. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay, well, I, I I'll continue. Um, well, there are many uh, different techniques when we are uh, studying uh, proteins, and uh, here lists some of the very common ones. And uh, we're trying to, as in our model, uh, make it easy, make research easier. Uh, now, um, one of the central topic here today uh, will be uh, Western blot, where um, it's a very uh, staple staple method in many, many labs. I think you might have uh, used it in your research as well. Now, um, as we go through uh, our research, um, the requirement changes with the time. When times are changing, it just seems like this method doesn't change with it. And uh, so um, let's look at what we are required to do now. Um, so um, take an example, and um, this is a basically a chart from a cell paper in 2000s. And in, in around that time, um, the Western results are relatively simple. You can um, take one different uh, fractionation and then uh, look at different fractions, um, look for your target, and that could make up a very um, good publication. Um, well, when we look at um, 2020, when we look at another um, a typical uh, Western result in a regulation study. Um, you see there are many, many different targets, there are mutations, and each one of these Western uh, markers are uh, quantitated, uh, and then they have the error bars. And so that entails two things. One, there's a lot more experiment that needs to be done, and, and that translates to a lot more time. Now, if we do this with a typical um, West, Western workflow, and as you can see, um, it contains many, many different steps, and that uh, would, would take many, many days to finish your research. The question we ask is, is there any way uh, for us to make this process um, a bit faster, a bit more uh, convenient for our researchers? Now, if we simplify this uh, pro, uh, with this process into different steps, um, we can take it from the sample preparation and then use the SDS page to separate different protein targets and then transfer these targets onto a membrane, either it's a nitrocellulose or PVDF. And then we uh, show the signal with, incub with incubation with different antibodies. And after that, we take our image and quantize, quantize it and then get our results. Uh, the whole process can be a very long day um, if we follow the very uh, conventional protocol. Um, for SDS page, uh, if you make your own gels and it'll take about an hour and then a couple hours to run the gels and it'll take about two hours to do a wet transfer. And then the very, um, 
involve steps of different incubations will take about roughly five hours. So if you put every uh, hour together, you get about 10 hours. That's where you, that's when you get your samples ready um, before you get any results. And that's a very long day if you wanna finish your uh, research in one day. Now, um, the, the one thing we wanna attack first is of course, um, the most the complicated part where all the incubations are done. And because they involve many different steps and then um, many steps have to be repeated multiple times, like washing usually have to be done at least three times each time. Between you switch between antibodies or between the blocking to a primary antibody. So um, that's why we um, worked on this little device called Easy West Light. Um, as the name entails, we are trying to make the whole incubation uh, process easier. Okay. Um, so many of you might not have ever heard of this because it's a new release. It's a new uh, device we just released to the market. And uh, so here is a, a enlarged picture of it. It's a ra relatively small um, and can fit on any bench top and it's relatively easy to use and which I'll uh, show you in the coming slides. Um, and here list some of the uh, key attributes for Easy West Lite. Um, so the goal of this device is to fully automate the incubation steps. That's starting from the blocking all the way to uh, the secondary uh, antibody incubation. And uh, we're hoping that by removing any manual process, uh, we can provide a more consistent results. And uh, we also design in this device um, to be able to recover both primary and secondary antibody so you, you could reuse it because sometimes, uh, the pri especially for primary antibodies, um, it's, uh, it can be hard to get and you want to uh, use it as much as you can, uh, you can tolerate. Um, so to, um, we also made this um, programmable, which uh, give it flexibility, where you can match it to your conventional protocol. Although typically you can reduce your incubation time on this device, um, but you can start from your standard protocol and uh, use it for um, your first experiment. And uh, the least, last but not the least, is it's an open platform. We don't um, tie it to any consumables and you can use uh, consumables existing in your lab. So um, here is just some more detailed numbers. So this device will take one set of antibodies, meaning one primary antibody and one secondary antibody. Um, but it can process two membranes at the same time. Um, you place both of them in the cassette and then you can process them at the same time. You can use strips. Sometimes you wanna cut your membrane into smaller strips and that's okay too. Um, so for the device, it fits mini gels. So if you use mini gels, um, we're um, looking into MIDI uh, cassette, which is coming soon, but right now it's, it fits MIDI gels only. Um, for antibody uh, volumes for primary and uh, secondary, you need about uh, nine mils of diluted antibody, and then you can recover them, uh, of course. And so um, this is just a little bit more details on it. And then uh, now let's look at how it all goes together. Now you have a device, when you get the device, you also get a, a cassette, which is on the right-hand side. It's, uh, it can be opened up with the lever on top. And once you open up, you can put your membranes in there. Um, so for your experiment, it's actually quite simple and easy to do. The first thing, of course, is to load your uh, blocking buffer and antibody solutions into the system. And then we use the uh, 50 mil standard 50 mil centrifuge tubes, and uh, you can um, put them in the corresponding slot in on the side of the uh, device. And once you've done that, it's time to load your membrane. And so you open up your cassette and it's marked on um, um, where the membrane should go and uh, where the high molecular weight and low molecular weight should orientate. Um, and the protein side is always facing up and then you put a spacer where the spacer is to keep 
the membrane from uh, floating around in the cassette when uh, we are doing the incubation because the device actually is uh, actively circulating uh, the solution to uh, make sure that we get a good incubation of uh, antibodies. So once you get everything set, you load your cassette onto the device, you program your uh, experiment, and you say start and walk away. And uh, the membrane will be ready when you come back. And uh, so that's um, what we are trying to do here is to make it easier. Uh, some results we have uh, when we have compared the Easy West Lite with the conventional um, Pro protocol. Um, one is using the housekeeping protein, a gap DH. As you can see, it's a very comparable result. Same goes for uh, EGFR, um, a different target, and or VDAC1. Um, this one is a little bit lighter um, because of the uh, abundance of the protein is uh, relatively lower. And so this is what we've done in our labs. We also have done some tests in our, um, you know, fellow researchers lab. Okay, this is one of the example and using um, GeneScript's anti-HIS uh, HRP uh, antibody, which is a primary antibody directly connected to HRP. Um, so as you can see, if you look at both the manual uh, protocol results from the left and then compared to the Easy West uh, the results from the right, um, they both showed up nicely and then um, just seems like Easy West Light can produce uh, a little bit of uh, more uh, sensitivity. Um, but in reality, uh, most cases what you have is the comparable results to the manual protocol. So. Now, um, just to summarize the Easy West Lite part, um, so this device is designed to automate all the incubation steps for Western blotting. And that's uh, a lot of the hands-on and, uh, and sometimes kind of boring. So we want to you know, free you from that process so you can hit start and you can walk away and do uh, whatever else you think is, you know, more um, better, you know, for for a time. So the design of the device is easy to use, and it's actively circulated in the solutions um, for either blocking or antibodies during the incubation to make sure we get the best of the results. And by removing um, the manual operation, um, we're hoping to achieve better consistency, which we show in our uh, test results. Um, and, uh, and more importantly, it's an open platform. We're not locking out any of the reagents that you're currently using. You can still use them. Um, although after your first test, you might uh, need to tweak a little bit just to for a better uh, results. If it's too strong a band, maybe you want to reduce your antibody concentration a bit more. Um, you know, things like that. So we don't try to attach any mandatory proprietary uh, consumables to it. Um, so the device itself is really very, very, very small and you can fit it anywhere in your lab, okay? And uh, so at the last point, a bit of a pre-announcement is that we are actually, you know, researching an Easy West diluent. So this diluent is a reagent used to dilute your, um, your antibodies, and the, the goal of this diluent is twofold. Um, the first is we wanted this diluent to be able to reduce the amount of blocking you need. So it'll be replacing the milk or BSA that you typically use for blocking, and also be able to reduce the blocking to just a few minutes. And then the second goal is to um, for this uh, diluent is that it will be able to enhance um, the signal or reduce the incubation time. So we um, plan to have half the incubation time. So if typically you incubate for one hour, and with this diluent, you'll be able to cut that in half. And um, so this is at the very final stage of the research, and we're uh, almost ready to re re uh, release it into the market. And so um, with the Easy West device, uh, 
you can reduce um, the incubation time and then um, to about two hours. Now the whole Western process are cut down to about seven hours. It's still a full day work, but it's much better. Um, so fortunately, we already have other things in uh, in our repertoire to be able to further shorten this time uh, to a more manageable um, degree, and one of which is a transfer device. And as you know, that for many um, there there are many different type of transfer uh, method. Two of them are most commonly used, which is the wet transfer or what we call conventional wet transfer. And uh, it's a golden standard in terms of the methodology. And the downside of this is the setup is relatively complicated. And, and you need a lot of buffer, you need some ice and or a cold room to be able to set it up. And it also takes uh, quite a while to run the uh, experiment, um, usually um, at least two hours and sometimes overnight. Um, but it will give you good results. Now. Um, there's also um, some device on the market where you can get um, with the semi-dry method and it, it uses a lot less buffer and a lot less messy when you set it up. You can do the transfer, uh, finish it very quickly. Um, but the downside is whenever you have a protein that's a, a, just a tiny bit larger than it likes, it won't transfer very well. And uh, so that kind of... Uh, um, bothers a lot of researchers. Um, me as one of uh, you know one of them, and when I was working in the lab. So the question we ask is whether we can actually combine the two. So we can have some device that can transfer fast, but just as um, you know the wet transfer where we can get good results. So that's where the e block L1 um, um, is take the role. Um, and so this is on, the only device um, that, that uses the wet transfer um, principle um, in a fast transfer device. And you won't find anything else. Um, all the other devices, either it's a wet transfer, a slow wet transfer, or it's a fast semi-dry. So um, with eBlock L1, you'll be able to get the best of the both worlds and you will be able to get good results when transferring large proteins, and that's generally something that's a, larger than 100 kb. Um, or you're get, you, you can also get short transfer time, usually somewhere around uh, 12 minutes. So just to show some comparisons between the wet transfer and the e-blot uh, and the unique uh, fast wet transfer, and as you can see from our test data, that the transfer um, can be very comparable from eBlock L1 to the wet transfer, wet transfer that you typically use. Here are just some more comparison, not just to the wet transfer, um, but also for to some other devices uh, on the market. As you can see, um, while there's less of a difference with smaller protein, when you get to a larger protein like EGF, you see a lot more pronounced difference. Now here, we also have a story to tell from our um, research team, um, as this is a bit of an unusual um, case. Um, it just, it's just a story, and it's not a, a, a typical application per se, but it, it just shows how uh, well the wet transfer works with eBlock L1. So we have this customer in America where he's working on some massive, massive uh, complexes, and it's a large protein with multiple um, components, and he wanted to do a Western to uh, basically characterize it. And uh, he's tried basically everything before they found us. Uh, and uh, this protein is about, uh, you know, 1,200 kD, uh, which is usually not um, something that people uh, typically work on. That's out of the range. And uh, um, he's tried wet transfer. He's tried um, semi-dry, um, a different, all different kind of semi-dry devices, and he wasn't able to get. Uh, satisfying results. 
And uh, eventually, one day, he saw one of our uh, you know, flyers about the uh, eBlock L1. So he contacted us, and uh, he wanted to try it. And we say, well, well, we have not, not got a chance to try a protein complex, not large. We might as well do it. So um, we worked with him. Um, it didn't work um, that great at the beginning, but once we tweaked the protocol a little bit and we added um, some uh, extra uh, optimization into the protocol, um, we were able to actually get a very good results with this large complexes, which surprised us as well because we didn't know it could work um, that well. So. Yeah, just a story to show that um, there is also room to um, work with even larger complexes than the typical ranger from, uh, you know, 20 kD to maybe 200 kD. Now, with the uh, wet transfer, the eBlock L1, we were able we were able to uh, reduce our transfer time from two hours to about 10 uh, percent of that is uh, about you know, say 20 minutes. Uh, let's include the setup time, and of course, um, we can also reduce the you know time from um, the SDS page for sure um, to further downsize the five hour that we have to spend uh, you know working on the bench. And with that, you can uh, take a look at our uh, offering of uh, precast mini gels, and uh, these are specially designed gels, and that's. Uh, with a neutral buffer system, so it will it's very stable and uh, it has some good designs. Um, if you look at the lower <clears throat> right hand corner, you'll see the gene script design for the loading wells is uh, a little bit different from what you are typically see in the precast gel. So it has a notch at the very uh, top of the gel um, before the loading well, and that enlarges the loading um, capacity um, of the gel to a much larger um, sample volume. So it can go all the way up to about 80 microliters. So if you have samples that's low concentration, this will come in handy. And we also offer very complete concentrations uh, for fixed percentage gels or, um, or uh, gradient gels as well. So um, one of the features we designed into these gels is that they can be run at a very high uh, voltage, it's, uh, 200 volts. And at this voltage, you can finish the gel if you use a mass buffer system uh, within 20 minutes. Um, so 18 is you know, the limit um, usually. And uh, if you use the uh, MOPS buffer system for uh, larger protein separation, then usually it's around 30 minutes. And that's a lot faster than the hand cast gels in a typical lab. Um, this is just a, a comparison in case that you're wondering why there's two buffer system. We have the MOPS and then also the MES or MES uh, buffer system. Um, they both work for um, neutral gels um, equally well. It's just that their um, focused area of separation is uh, slightly different. Um, for MOPS, it's uh, designed to separate larger medium to large proteins, usually above 30 kDA. And uh, um, as you can see on the left-hand side gel, the larger protein gets separated a lot better, and then while the smaller protein get compressed together. Um, on the other hand, if you use the MES buffer system, you get much better separation for smaller proteins um, and uh, um, a little bit less separation on the top of uh, the gel. Well, for Western blotting, it's usually not a big deal because we are doing something that's uh, um, specific to certain targets, so either would be able to work for Western blot. Um, here's some uh, comparisons in terms of resolution as we enlarge on the section of the gels running. Um, Hello. Is there a, is there, yes, Hello, Dr. John? Cassie? Yes. Yeah, we can't. Uh, we can't see your screen right now. It's missing. You, Could you share it again? Oh, really? Uh, let yeah. me uh, try to share it again. I'm sorry. Um, let me see. There must be some uh, internet connection issues. 
Uh, just give me a yeah, second. We, it's we, uh, coming up. Can. No problem. Okay. I think we lost it like uh, five minutes ago. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, let's see. I guess we can share the slide. Okay, now it's sharing again. Let me know if you see it. Yes, I can see your screen right now. Oh, that's great. Okay, should I continue? <laughs> right? Okay, uh, let me do that. Yeah. We can yeah. also share, I guess we can also share the slides, um, you know, with a link yes. and just so, so that yeah. we have yeah. the uh, full information. Okay, thank you. No, um, problem. no problem. All right, let's continue here. All right, so where we are, okay. Um, MES buffer. It's a. Uh, it's better for smaller um, proteins, but um, you know both works well for Western blot because it's a very specific methodology. Uh, now this is just a comparison of the separation uh, resolution. Um, if we enlarge on the um, on the gels on the section, these are just lysate loaded equal amount onto uh, each of gels. And as you can see on, on the shore page, which is the gene script gels, you can have very good separations uh, within this range. Um, so some hand, uh, homemade gels, which is the third to the left, and, and it, it gets blurry. And especially this will be more pronounced if the gel has been stored for a while, the separation will not be as sharp, okay? And uh, there's also other precast gels, and as, as you can see, um, the resolution, um, you know, is not as comparable, um, especially from, um, you know, the, um, the second to the left uh, gels. There's some missing bands in the middle, and uh, so, um, so this is just show some of the details um, of the, um, the gels that we have. Okay, and also, um, and there's also um, a bit of the um, experience that I'd like to share with you is that um, a lot of times it's not just the gels that um, changes the result of your um, the final separation of your protein. Um, it, it's also the the sample buffers, um, regardless of what kind of gels you use, and it's always. Um, a good idea to use a good sample buffer. So here we compare the typical uh, lamellar buffer with the LDS buffer that uh, uh, we have and we use in our labs all the time. Um, and we run a lysate process with these uh, buffers. And when you uh, enlarge on the um, when you enlarge on this section. And if you look at the separation, you can see um, on the LDS buffer, even though you run it on the same sure page gels, you have a much better uh, separation with the LDS buffer compared to the limonite buffer. So um, if you have not tried it before, try it and see for yourself. Uh, now with the um, precast gels, we uh, can cut the separation time to about half an hour. Now we sum everything together, it just seems like we were able to get the whole process done in about, let's say, three hours. That's a much, um, I would say that's a much welcome, you know, improvement from the 10 hours we used to have to spend in the lab. Okay. So just before we finish our topic today, I, I think I'd like to bring in the e -Stan as well. Uh, not just because it's a device that we offer, it's also an um, um, uh, application that we recently uh, developed. Uh, so as you probably know, e -Stan is a device to stain uh, gels um, using um, a blue dye, and that's uh, similar to uh, Kamasi stain. Um, but with a better sensitivity. Now it looks similar to eBlot, and it's under um, somewhat similar principle. Um, and uh, so the goal is to shorten the staining uh, gel staining time. Usually it's uh, three to six hours, um, and now we can do it in about ten minutes. But that's not the uh, main point here. Um, so here shows some of the stain results. You can get very good and even stain across the board. 
Um, so recently, we have developed a protocol, um, which is available uh, for free on our website, where you can go uh, just search for e or L1, and you can find the protocol on your right-hand side um, as a link. It's a PDF file. You can download it. And uh, so in this protocol, we use the Pansu stain to uh, stain uh, membranes for um, sometimes um, the total protein uh, normalization process. So you can use this to stain uh, the membranes very quickly and uh, get a very sharp stain. And you can use that to quantize the total protein uh, of your gel if you uh, need to use uh, the total protein uh, normalization for your Western blocks. So yeah, just a, a bit of a, a tidbit here. Um, now, um, the back to a bit of a summary for today's talk and uh, uh, after a few years of work, we were able to make three-hour Western a reality. Okay, this doesn't come in one in one go. We have um, put our efforts into multiple devices and consumables to be able to do that. Um, so that's what we covered today here. That's Easy West Lite, which is what we just launched, a fully automated Western incubation device. Um, the eBlot L1, the only fast wet transfer device that you will find, and then also our very good quality short page precast gels. And bring these together, that will be able to get your Western process down to about three hours and uh, um, from the 10 hours we used to have to spend. So uh, with that, I will conclude my uh, talk today. And I thank you for uh, attending this webinar. And I really appreciate um, your time. And uh, now I open up the floor for any questions you might have. And Cassie, if you uh, read it to me, and I can answer it yes. online. Definitely. So thanks, Dr. John, for the presentation. We'll go through the questions from the floor right now. So the first question, uh, depending on the protein size, what is the average time for e block to perform transfer? For E blood usually um, it'll take about twelve minutes. I'd say our experience uh, tells us about twelve minutes would be able to work for most of the size of proteins. For a larger protein, something that's you know around like two hundred kD, that you might need a bit of uh, optimization. But usually for a typical protein, somewhere around a hundred or forty kD, um, twelve minutes is more than enough. I see. Okay. Uh, the next question, uh, does your system accept non-precast gel? Yeah, yeah, it does work. Um, depending on, sometimes depending on the quality of the gels, um, when you say system, I'm not sure which system um, you, um, you mean. Um, if it's e stain, yes, it does accept you know, homemade gels um, as to e blot. It does as well um, for some gels um, because of uh, the um, polymerization is not very complete sometimes in the homemade gels. Um, when you transfer in the e blot, if you use a very fast speed, um, the gels might get a little bit mushy, but you'll still get your transfer done. So that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dr. John. Uh, there's a few questions from uh, one attendee, so we'll take it one by one. The first question, is it correct that the instrument only takes two hours in total from blocking to secondary antibody intubation? This is uh, referring to the Easy West instrument. Well, um, I would say it depends. I would have to qualify this. Um, and, and because Easy West is a device that's open um, to different protocols. That really is depend on the protocol you use. Now, um, the two hours I was mentioning is more about um, if we combine it with the Easy West diluent. Right now, if we use a standard protocol, it'll still take um, you know whatever time you use to do it. The only I think the advantage of of using it is that. Um, that you'll be able to walk away. You do not have to safeguard it, and then you don't do not have to worry about uh, going back every five minutes to change buffer. 
So, um, but once we have the Easy West diluent, then you will be able to cut either further cut down the time. Um, so, hope that I made that clear. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dr. John. Uh, the next question: How many gels or membranes can be transferred at a time? This is also for Easy West. <sighs> Uh, if we talk about transfer, I think it might be uh, eblot then, um, because you know eblot is the transfer device. Um, so for eblot, um, the cassette size can I think can fit. So there are actually two cassettes on each device. They're they're independent to each other, um, and uh, so that you can transfer two gels at the same time. Um, and and they can be transferred, you know, at different pace if you like. So. Okay. Uh, the next question: uh, Can the instrument, the Easy West instrument, process with more than one primary antibody at a time? Right now, no. no. Um, for each run, you use one set of antibodies, one primary and one secondary. We are working on a pro version of the device, which will give you that capability. Where um, currently we're looking at something like you know four primary antibodies and uh, um, I think two or three secondary antibodies, um, and. Uh, um, that's coming soon, um, but in this Easy West Light device, um, it's one set of antibodies. Okay, thanks, Dr. John. Uh, the next question is uh, regarding to the e-stain system. So, which types of protein gels are e-stain protein staining system compatible with? So we we I think the most of our tests are done with the sure page gels. So I would say sure page gels will work the best. And we had experience with our customers who has used other gels on the system as well. They uh, work just fine. Um, but our experience is that you know seems to uh, you know confirm that you know most gels will stand well on the East End device. Okay, thanks, Dr. John. So another question, what about cross-contamination issues in the Easy West instruments due to residue of buffers remaining from the buffers that are used earlier? Okay, I see. Um, so we have looked at that very carefully. Um, so there are a um, couple ways to, um, to basically avoid that. And so the first is that after each protocol, we have a washing process where um, the system will be completely washed and all the antibody will be uh, removed from the system. And after a number of uses, let's say if you've used it for a month or for 20 membranes, um, then it's uh, also um, there's also a protocol where you can um, deep clean your device using um, you know, more, how to say, um, more strong, stronger um, cleaning solutions to further remove all the residues of, uh, from all the components in the solutions, like, you know, milk or, and any kind of protein residues that's in the system. So, so in our test, we do not see um, contaminations uh, when we are testing for it, so. Okay, Ken, thanks, Dr. John. So the next question, how specific is the antibody recovery for, from Easy West and also how pure would that be? Um, when, so since each of the incubation is done separately and when it's recovered, it's, it's just going to be similar to um, the solution that you put into the system. Of course, um, because there might be residual washing buffer from the steps before, um, you might get a slightly larger volume, um, a little bit, little bit of dilution, but that's usually not a concern. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Dr. John. So uh, the next question, for Easy West, how many membranes can be processed at a time? Uh, two membranes one set of antibodies and two membranes. And the membranes can be set face-to-face uh, -face with a spacer in the middle, um, or actually two spacers, one on top, one on the bottom. 
to keep them from floating and, uh, and they can be processed at the same time. We've tested it and it works well. Okay, thanks Dr. John. The next question, can the Western block, uh, can the Western block be, be performed on a gel that has been stained with e-stained protein staining system? Uh, we've not tried that. I would say that's probably okay. Um, but usually it's not, it's not recommended, I would say. I would say if you want to do this, you want to stay in the gel and also look at the Western blot, I would run two gels with the sure page and side by side, and they should have um, the same sample loaded on them. And one I would use for protein, uh, the gel staining, and the other one I would use for Western blotting. And uh, um, that should give you a much better and more reliable results. And that'll be my recommendations. Okay, thanks, Dr. John. Uh, we'll take on the last question from the floor. So the last question, can I blot very thin or very thick gel using the e-blot protein transfer system? Uh, sorry, can, can you repeat that? It was breaking up a bit. Uh, yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, so can I blot a very thin or a very thick gel using the e-blot protein transfer system? A very thick gel, I see. Um, yes, the, the answer would be yes, you can. Um, however, the condition might need to be um, tweaked a bit. Um, and also, um, because the gel, if the gel is thick, you're looking for a good transfer. Um, it might take a bit longer, and also um, the uh, the voltage we use might need to be a slightly different. So the condition might need to be tweaked a bit, but I, I believe it'll work just fine. Um, if you have a you know specific you know depth, um, could let us know. Then we can look into our um, data set and to see if we have tried anything similar to it. Um, and just, yeah, just reach out to us um, on, offline and we'll be able to help you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, there's one more question that came in just now. Maybe we'll just take this one last question. Sure, yeah. Okay, so uh, can we use our lab made staining and de-staining solution and how do we optimize the e-stain system? Uh, do you mean uh, use the homemade solutions uh, instead of the right. stain solutions? Yeah. Um, there's yes, a yeah, specific recipe. I understand, yes. Um, you can make that solution yourself if you would like to, and I think that's possible. Um, you know, but in my you know, sometimes it might vary a bit because, you know, when you make the solution, if it's not made in uh, a factory, you know, the consistency might not be as good. Um, so you might have slightly different results, um, you know, if you um, use your own solution, but you can, um, that, that'd be my answer. So yes, you can use the solution. Uh, you might get inconsistency once for a while. Um, that's usually because in the lab, um, different people are making the solution and then many people are using the solution. So um, you might, you know, get, you know, here and there uh, some inconsistencies, okay? Okay, all right, thanks Dr. Okay. John. So due to time constraint, we'll just end the Q&A session here. Mm -hmm. So for those questions that we didn't get to answer just now, I'll email back the answers to you. So thank you once again, Dr. John, for the great presentation and to all of us who joined us today. And so sorry about the technical issue just now. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye-bye.